Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, we already covered, uh, well, the first time we saw inverse functions, we saw them as uh, the derivatives of inverse functions as a consequence of implicit differentiation on the chain rule. And we've done the derivative of the inverse sine function. Um, and naturally, we, you would want to know, if possible, the derivatives of the various other um, inverse trig functions. So I'm going to quickly cover, once again, uh, the derivation for the derivative of the inverse sine function. And uh, th then we'll do the other ones a bit more quickly. Basically, the steps are, are the same. OK. So uh, the inverse sine function. So for, first of all, in, for, for functions in general, let's say uh, f is sending u elements of u <coughs> to elements of v, and it has a derivative f prime of x, which is not equal to 0. Now there's another function which will send y equals f of x back to x in the opposite direction. Let's say f inverse sends v to u. Then we found uh, that the derivative with respect to y of f inverse of y, where y equals f of x, is equal to 1 over the derivative of f with respect to x. OK? So once you have that, you have two choices. You can leave it there, like this, in which case for any y, you have to figure out what the x is. Mm -hmm. Or the other choice is that if you have something to help you, like a trig identity, for example, you might be able to um, get rid of the x and express the x in terms of y. That's what happens with the... Uh, that's what happens with the inverse uh, sine function. And maybe we can uh, maybe we can have that happen uh, with, the, say, the inverse cos function and the other trig function, inverse trig functions. OK, so once again, quickly through the derivation of the inverse sine. And once you get the idea of that, hopefully uh, how the other ones work will become clear. OK, so. Here's the original function, the sine function. This is its uh, uh, graph as you go from 0 to 2 pi, I mean, from minus 2 pi to 2 pi, and imagine this extending out over the entire real line. OK, it repeats sinusoidally. And OK, so if sine is a function from reals to reals, is it one to one or, or and on to? No, it's not. It takes the same values over and over again. Um, and it's not on to, there's no sine of x, there's no x such that sine of x is equal to 37, for example. So it's not on to the reals either. Okay, so it's not one to one, it's not on to, therefore there is no inverse function if you think of sine as mapping from reals to reals. On the other hand, what if we redefine the sine function? We say that the sine function, this new function, will map from minus pi over two to pi over two closed interval minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 to the closed interval from minus 1 to 1. And then this function is 1 to 1 and on to. And so you can talk about an inverse. Let's consider the plot. If you look there, you'll see that it's, it's 1 to 1 because, you know, if you draw a horizontal line anywhere, it only hits one point, right, not two. And it's on to because it takes all the values in between minus 1 and 1. All right, and the derivative of the sine is the cosine function. The cos so the, this will also come into play in our derivation. So I want you to notice something here. On that interval from minus pi over two to plus pi over two, the uh, cosine is never negative. Okay, so that'll be useful a little later. All right, so let's just get going then. So we can actually talk about an inverse of this redefined sine function. So we let y equals sine of x, 
and then the inverse sine of y will equal x. Um, so now what would the chain rule say? It would say that if you're thinking of y as a function of x, that the derivative of the inverse sine of y with respect to y times the inner function, which is y, right, dy by dx, which is cos of x, is equal to the derivative of x with respect to x, which is 1. OK, so uh, the, the, we, 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 we have this relationship for between the sine and the inverse sine. They're inverses of each other. And we can differentiate that first equation with respect to x. And we're letting y be sine of x. So we will get that the derivative with respect to y of the inverse sine of y equals 1 over the derivative with respect of the original function, which was sine of x. And the derivative of sine of x is cos of x. So the derivative with respect to y of the sine inverse of y is equal to 1 over cos of x, using this general formula uh, for the derivatives of inverse functions where they exist. OK, <clears throat> so now. We can get rid of the x. And the reason is that uh, y is equal to the sine of x. And we have the identity that cos squared x plus sine squared x is equal to 1. And that means that cos squared x plus y squared <coughs> is equal to 1. And that means that cos of x <coughs> is equal to <coughs> plus or minus the root of 1 minus y squared. So. Remember up here, we had 1 over the cos of x. <coughs> Excuse me. And now I would like to express cos of x in terms of y. And I get that cos of x equals plus or minus the root of 1 minus y squared. Now, it should be one or it should be the other. It can't be both at the same time. <coughs> so which of these two solutions do we want? Well, remember the graph of cos of x on this interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, all the cosine values were greater than or equal to 0. So this negative root of 1 minus y squared is not happening. There's no negative values coming out from cos of x on that interval. So we must want plus the root of 1 minus y squared. OK. So then. <clears throat> D by dy. Sorry, did you, uh, uh, repeat this again. Yeah. I can. I my possible solutions for the cosine of x are plus or minus the root of one minus y squared. If I take minus root of one minus y squared as the solution, it would mean that I could get negative values for the cosine. But on the interval that I've restricted the domain. I know I, I've restricted the x values from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. And I showed you the graph of cosine on that interval. And on that interval, cosine was never negative. So <clears throat> the negative solution it can't be arising. That's a spurious solution. So cosine of x must be equal to plus root of 1 minus y squared. Okay, any other questions about question. that one? No question. Yes? Uh, so can't we just differentiate the inverse sine function implicitly? For example, if you define y is equals to sine of x, right? You yes. can say x is equals to sine inverse of y. Yes. No, wait. You can define a separate function as x is equals, y is equals to sine inverse of x, and you can just differentiate that implicitly. Yeah, that's what we're in doing. In order to obtain the same expression. That's what we've done. Yeah. Wait, have we done implicit yeah. differentiation here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Fair enough. That's where the general formula for the derivative of an inverse function comes from. Okay. So, I, we, we already had that the derivative of the inverse sine was 1 over the cosine. And we found that the cosine should be root of 1 minus y squared. 
So the derivative of inverse sine with respect to y equals one over the root of one minus y squared. Okay. <clears throat> and if you want to interchange x and y, then the derivative with respect to x of the inverse sine of x equals one over the root of one minus x squared. Okay. Now, uh, we would like to do the other one. Okay, so this is a review of what we did before. We would like to do the inverse cosine also, for example. And the reasoning will go much the same way. All right. But first, let's do a, a problem with, supposing I wanted to differentiate this as this, f of x equals three times the inverse sine of x squared plus x plus one. So what would the derivative look like? Over one square root of one plus x squared plus x plus one. Yeah. Almost. So that and into um, x plus one. Yeah, that's right. So it would be three over the root of one minus those terms in the brackets times the derivative of the terms in the brackets. So there's an outer function which is the inverse sine. There's an inverse function which is this polynomial. So chain rule says differentiate oh, yeah. inverse sine with respect to its argument and then multiply it by the derivative of this polynomial. Okay. So, so the derivative of this polynomial will be in the numerator, right? Yeah, you could put that in the numerator. So can you go back to the previous slide where yes. the inverse function is given? Uh, sir, the answer would be three over under root one minus these things in the bracket. Yeah. And uh, the derivative squared. of these things in the uh, 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 these things in the bracket squared. Yeah. One. Yeah. Three uh, times one over the root of one minus bracket squared times the derivative of what's in the bracket, which is two x plus one. So the derivative would be in the denominator. No, I just, just write it out the way the chain rule gives it to you, okay? It's not wrong to put it in the denominator, but the point is that the poor fellow who has to mark your paper, so, okay. he doesn't want to see seven different versions of the same thing, right? So don't simplify. Okay. Just whatever the chain rule gives you, that's what it is, okay? All right, so I want to take the derivative of the cosine, okay, once again. Uh, the inverse cosine, uh, before I define the inverse cosine, I'd better think about the cosine. Does it actually have an inverse? If I'm thinking about mapping it from reals to reals, if, this is, if, this, if cosine is a map from reals to reals, then it is not one-to-one -one and it is not onto, and it does not have an inverse function. Okay, so let's redefine the cosine. Let's say that it only maps from zero to pi. Okay. On, it's defined on the interval from zero to pi, the closed interval, and it maps to the closed interval minus one to plus one. Okay. Once you have that, it's going to be one to one and onto, and therefore it will have an inverse. And the inverse will map in the opposite direction. Okay. From minus one, one to zero pi. Okay. So this cosine, now that I've restricted it to the domain from zero to pi, this is what the graph looks like, right? And this is one to one and onto. Um, <clears throat> okay, its derivative is cosine is minus sine, right? So what does is, what is the sine function look like from zero to pi? It looks like this. Once again, the sine function has no negative values from zero to pi, okay? We're going to use that fact a little later. Okay, so now we can talk about an inverse function. We can say y is equal to the cos of x. And then if I apply the inverse sine on both sides, the inverse cosine, sorry, on both sides, I would get that x is equal to the inverse cosine of y. Okay. So then... Uh, once again, let me stress that we are restricted. The, the inverse cosine 
has to map in the opposite direction. So it's mapping from minus 1, 1 to 0, pi. OK, and now, so these two functions are each other's inverses. So co cos inverse of cos of x equals x and cos of cos inverse of y equals y. The two functions cancel each other out in a sense. OK, so now we're going to take the derivative of that first equation using implicit differentiation and the chain rule. And then we're going to uh, do a bit of algebra. And what do you get? Uh, you, the, you get the usual rule for um, inverse functions when the inverse function exists. The derivative with respect to y of the inverse function acting on y is equal to 1 over the derivative with respect to x of the original function acting on x. And the derivative of cosine of x is minus sine of x. So the derivative with respect to y of the cos inverse of y is equal to minus 1 over the sine of x. OK, can someone tell me what the next step is? Sine square x. Get rid of the, get rid of the x. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I'm so we know y is equals to cosine of x. We can square both terms. That gives us y squared is equals to cosine squared, which we can express in the, which we can express as one minus sine squared of x. Yeah. Exactly. Y equals cos of x, so we know that sine squared x plus y squared equals sine squared x plus cos squared equals 1. Now we need to express sine of x as plus or minus the root of 1 minus y squared. So there's two possible solutions. Which one am I going to take? Uh, negative 1 positive, because... Positive, uh, no, positive the positive one. Positive one. Positive one. Positive one because the sine is never negative on the allowed interval, right? for x? Yeah, exactly. Right. So, yeah, on the interval, sine is never negative. So sine of x is root of 1 minus y squared. And then, so what do I have? I have the derivative with respect to y of the inverse function acting on y. We already had that that was equal to minus 1 over the sine of x. But we just figured out that sine of x is the root of 1 minus y squared. So the derivative with respect to y of the inverse cosine of y is minus 1 over the root of 1 minus y squared. Is that OK? Very good. Sir, so if you are uh, asked to uh, find out the, the uh, you know, tangent or you know, the gradient at x, x is equals to like pi over 4. So how do we do it in this specific case? No, but is pi over 4 within the range of? Uh, uh, yes, uh, since it's uh, within the range of 0 to pi. OK, so then the derivative would be minus 1 over the root of 1 minus pi over 4 squared. OK, so we uh, don't plug, uh, you know, uh, cos inverse of x, you know, cos inverse of pi over 4 in. Uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, the, the point is that the, the, the thing that you feed into cos inverse of y, as long as that's between minus 1 and plus 1, then its derivative will be minus 1 over the root of 1 minus y squared. So over here we have the value of y. We have okay. If, if, y. if no, look, there, there, there's really two solutions here, right? One is you say I'm going to give you cos. I'm going to give you y, and then the derivative is minus one over sine of x. So I gave you y. Now you go figure out x, and what its sine is, and then it's minus one over the sine of x. Okay. The other thing to do is to say I don't really need to do that. Because I've solved for sine of x in terms of y. So I can use this other equation, minus 1 over the root of 1 minus y squared. Okay? Use whichever one is easier for you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so now if we write it in terms of x, then d by dx of cos inverse of x, remember x is going from minus 1 to plus 1 is equal to minus 1 
over the root of one minus x squared. Notice that if you get out of the range from minus one to plus, if you, it, it, plus one, you know, bad things are going to happen, right? You're going to be trying to take the roots of negative numbers, which we don't do in this case. Okay. Uh, tangent. Okay. If it, um, so, running through quickly now, because we've seen this a number of times. The tangent function, if you think of it as being from reals to reals, it doesn't make sense. There's places in the reals where it's not defined. If you take out those points, then still it, 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 it's not one to one, right? So if you make a restriction that you're going to map on the open interval from minus pi over two to pi over two, and you don't allow it to touch minus pi over two or pi over two where it would blow up, and then you're saying tangent is, that's the domain of the tangent mapping to the reals, then that, that, new, that restricted tan is one-to-one -one and onto, it's onto the reals. And so the inverse function maps reals to minus pi over two to pi over two. Okay. Um, okay, so now, we want to take the derivative. Let y over x, let y of x equal tangent of x. And then the derivative is the inverse tangent. X equals the inverse tangent of y. Okay. What is the derivative of the inverse tangent of y with respect to y? Apply the one general formula. over secant squared of x? Yeah. It's 1 over the derivative with respect to x of the tangent of x, and the derivative of the tangent is secant squared. Okay. No, so wait, if it's one over secant squared, can't you just simplify that by saying that it's just the same as cosine squared? Right, you could call it cosine squared, or you could call it one plus tangent squared. Right? One over one plus tangent squared. Yeah. Now, ah. tangent squared though is y squared. One over one plus y squared. So yeah. that so the derivative basically becomes one over one plus y squared. Yes. The derivative with respect to y of the inverse tangent of y equals one over one plus y squared. Okay. So in all of these, what we're doing is we use the general formula. We get something one over some function of x. Now we want we rewrite that function of x in terms of y. Okay, so the derivative with respect to y of the inverse tangent of y equals one over one plus y squared. Okay. Or if you want to write it in terms of x, d by dx of inverse tangent of x equals one over one plus y squared. One. So one over one plus x squared. Okay, now uh, let me ask you. I'll let you think about this one. Supposing I had a function and I take its derivative and the derivative is one over one plus four x squared. Can you get, guess what f of x might be? Tan 2x? Yeah, it might be something like inverse tangent of 2x. Um, you might. Yeah, so inverse. inverse. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good first guess, and then you might find that you have to multiply by a constant or something. Okay, Look, try this one. Okay. Um, inverse cotangent, pretty much the same discussion. Uh, we have to restrict its domain to make it one to one and onto, so we make this distinction. We, make, we restrict its domain to the open interval from zero to pi, not including zero and not including pi, where the function would blow up. And then you're mapping to the reals. So the inverse function has to map from the reals to open interval zero to pi. Okay, so what is the derivative of the inverse cotangent of y? Can you repeat your question? What's the derivative of the inverse cotangent of y? 
with respect to y? 1 over minus cosecant squared. Okay. It will be 1 over the derivative with respect to x of the cotangent of x, which will equal 1 over, as you say, right? And then, uh, so I leave it to you as an exercise, you work out using this using the same logic as we did with basically the same steps as we did with the tangent you should be able to work out that the derivative with respect to x so the co inverse cotangent of x is equal to minus one over one plus x squared okay all right inverse secant Okay, first of all, what's the definition of secant? Does anybody remember? One over cosine. One over cosine, right? So everywhere where you get the, everywhere where you get the, uh, the cosine being zero, it won't be defined, right? Right, so uh, it won't be defined at pi over two, for example. Okay, so if we take the interval, the closed interval from zero to pi, and we toss out pi over two, and right? we never let it be pi over two, then uh, uh, that's that's a dom that's a domain that will allow um, secant to be one to one, and we'll make it onto sir, its range. So do we uh, need to remember these domains? When yeah. attempting the paper? Yeah, well, I don't know what's on the paper right now, but you could, right? Okay. You could need that. Okay, so uh, then uh, we the values that you get, you don't get values between minus one and plus one. You get all the other real numbers, okay? So it's minus infinity to minus one union one to infinity, and the inverse secant works in the opposite direction, okay? So, <clears throat> what's the derivative going to be? The derivative of the inverse secant of y with respect to y will be one over the derivative with respect to x of the secant of x, which is one over, what's the derivative of secant? Uh, secant x tan x. Right, secant x tan x. So now, uh, how are tangent x and secant x related? One plus tan squared. Tan squared. Is it called secant squared? Yeah, right. So you, you're going to get your secant that way. Okay. So then after you do the algebra, uh, I mean, like I said, try this. Try this. It's good if you can go through this yourself. But I mean, the, the result, the derivation will be in your textbook. Uh, again, you use it. You use a trigonometric identity to replace uh, to replace the uh, the x, right? So you get things completely in terms of y. Okay, so. And then eventually you end up with d by dx of the inverse secant of x is equal to one over the absolute value of x times root of x squared minus one. Okay. Now, uh, the, uh, we're going for cosecant. Again, cosecant uh, is defined from minus pi over two to pi over two, except at zero where it will blow up. So uh, we're going to take the interval from minus pi over two to plus pi over two, and we're going to throw out zero. Okay. And then that gives you values that lie between minus infinity to minus one, and then from one to infinity, you get no values that are strictly between minus one and plus one out of the cosecant, right? 
And then the inverse cosecant has to go in the opposite direction. So with that restricted domain, um, you, you get a function which is one to one and on to. You go through the same deal. Uh, how are cosecant and cotangent related? Anyone remember? One plus cot square x is equal to cosecant square. Okay. Right. So you should be able to then show that d by dx of the inverse cosecant is equal to minus one over the absolute value of root of x squared minus one. So they are related by which equation? Uh, what was it? One plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared or something. I, I can never remember that one. Yeah, that's the same. One plus cot square x is equal to cosecant square. Yeah, right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, I hope you then you have the general idea, right? Apply the general formula. Apply some rule or identity. Get everything in terms of y. And and there's your answer, right? Okay, uh, sir. Why is it the absolute value? Oh. Uh, because the um, the result will always be negative overall. Okay. Yeah, I mean this, this is another discussion of, about if you if you consider the derivative and and you plot it on the uh, allowed thing whether whether you get positive values or negative values. All right, so how would you do this one? D by dx of x cubed. So the, the, there's, a, there's a couple of notations. One is sine inverse. You write it with a minus one. It doesn't mean one over. It means the inverse function. The other is a sine means the same thing as the inverse sine. OK, so here I've written a sine just so that you see both notations. Okay. Do we apply the product rule here? Okay, right. We'd try the product rule here. So it would be x cubed times 1 over the root of 1 minus x squared plus the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared times inverse sine of x. Okay, so that would be the derivative here. Okay, so that one's easy. Okay. Right, and again, some people write tan with a minus sub superscript minus one. That doesn't mean one over tan. It means the inverse of tangent. Okay. Other people write a tan for the inverse tangent. Um, and you, you should know both notations. Okay. Okay. How would we do this one? Quotient rule. Right. The quotient rule. Right. So one minus inverse tangent times the derivative of one plus inverse tangent, which is one over one plus x squared, minus one plus the inverse tangent times the derivative of minus of one minus the inverse tangent, which is minus one over one plus x squared, divided by the bottom the denominator function squared, which is one minus inverse tangent of x all squared. Um, please don't do simplifications unless they actually lead to something remarkably simple, right? If you do a simplification and you come up with two, then okay, that's, that's nice. But if I have something with three terms and you put them together and then you put them over a common denominator, that will not make me happy, okay? Otherwise, just do whatever the quotient rule gives you. All right, write out all the terms. Okay. F, f of x is equals to two x plus 10 times the inverse cotangent of x. 
Uh, and I ask you, if I ask you, when is the tangent line, at what point is the tangent line to the graph of F horizontal? What am I asking you in terms of derivatives? When the d of d of x equals to zero. Yeah, when the, the tangent line is horizontal at a point, if the derivative is zero at that point. Okay. So Sir, if x is zero or the derivative is zero, uh, if, if when x, it is horizontal. Uh, if, if the derivative of the function is zero at some point, then the tangent line is horizontal at that point. Okay, so we'll put f f in uh, f uh, the derivative as zero, and then we'll get the value of yeah, x. Yeah, put the derivative at zero and see if you can solve for x. Okay. 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 Um, differentiate the inverse cotangent of one over x minus the inverse tangent of x. We have enough time, I think. Uh, can, can, can I give you a couple of minutes? You can tell me what the answer is. So do we have to differentiate this? Yeah, differentiate it and tell me what you get. Minus one. You get minus one? Yeah. Okay. What does anyone else get? Minus two over x squared plus one. Okay, so we've got two different answers. Does anyone want to? Sir, I think it's a into one over sine one over x. And, um, no, 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 I didn't differentiate. I got minus one. Sir, it's minus one. So I got minus one. Okay. So I think it's minus x square minus one over x square plus one. That becomes negative one. So is it zero? Yeah, the derivative is zero. That function is actually- Yes, I'm also getting zero. Yeah, that function is constant, okay. So the derivative is zero. Okay. All right, so let's finish with this. Supposing that I have the inverse tangent function and I need to evaluate it near x is equal to zero. Okay, what, what is the value of the inverse tangent at x equals zero? If the tangent of something is zero, what is that something? The tangent of what number is zero? One. The tangent of zero is zero, right? Tangent is sine over the cosine. Sine of zero is zero, right? Okay. Now, what is um, what is the derivative of the inverse tangent? One over one to the x squared. Right, and so the derivative of the inverse tangent when x equals zero is what? One minus 
fine. Right. So f of x, if, if let's say f of x equals inverse tangent of x, near x equals zero is approximated linearly as f of x equals f of zero, which is zero, plus the derivative at zero, which is one, times x minus zero. So f of x is approximately equal to x when x is close to zero. Okay. Kind of weird, but yeah. Okay, so that's it for today's session. Um, I'll stick around for a few minutes if uh, people have questions. Otherwise, I'll see you on Thursday. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask, where can we find these slides since they're not uploaded on LMS? Uh, they're, LM, they're on the they're on the Moodle page for this course. So they are on LMS. I've just opened. No, oh, they're them. on. Uh, they are well. Okay. <laughs> Where in the LMS? Yes, they are on LMS. Okay, just what, a sec. Uh, just a sec. Let me. I'll. I'll. I'll pull up the page for you. Okay. No, that's not it. Okay, sorry. This. This is it. All right. Go to lms.lums.edu.pk and then you go to the course and the slides are all here. Okay. Okay, sir, thank you. Right. The alternative is I've made the slides available on my OneDrive. So I've also sent you the link for that in an email. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. In the slide number 46, how is the answer zero? Slide number 46. Okay. So what's it going to yes, be? The, the, the derivative is what? The derivative is minus one over one plus one over X squared. Then all of that times minus one over x squared, the derivative of one over x, right? Minus one over one plus x squared. And then if you multiply everything out, you should get zero in the denominator. Put everything over a common denominator and oh, you get zero. Oh. Uh, sir, I understood the second part, but in the first part, you said it's minus one over one plus one over x whole square. The one over x term would be squared, right? No, it's one over one. It's minus one over yeah. one plus x squared. Uh, one plus x squared, but over here, x is one over x. So it would be one okay, over x. Okay, right. In the, in the first one, x is one over x. So then you have to multiply everything through by minus one over x squared. Uh, that's the derivative of one over x. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sir, could you uh, move to slide 18? I need to check something. Slide 18. Okay, so sir, here the answer is going to be um, one into three over the root of one minus x squared plus x plus one into yeah. two x plus one. Yeah, it'll be three times one over the root of one minus everything in the brackets squared times the derivative of the bracket within the bracket. Um, uh, the derivative of the bracket is that within the root or outside the root? That'll be outside. All right. Uh, sir? Yes. 
Uh, sir, I wanted to ask uh, those that if we study from your slides plus uh, the homework that, that you have given us, uh, would it be okay for our midterm or should we study more? Yeah, that should that? be good enough for your midterm. Yeah. All right, sir. Yes, sir, um, how many uh, hours do you advise for us studying this for this course? <laughs> it, it, it depends, I think, on how strong your background. When 24. And, uh, I mean, I, 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 I do think that if you, uh, you do the exercises, you note the ones that you had trouble on, right? And then you uh, look at those again, then that should, uh, that should do it. If you feel you can do all the exercises in the web work, then that's a good start. And the web work can't actually test everything like uh, the intermediate value theorem or the extreme value theorem. Those things you have to, uh, uh, those things you do have to review, right? But sir, you also posted questions, uh, uh, tutorial questions. So if we cover them as well, so uh, plus the verb work. So I yeah, guess... I mean, I mean, I, I, I hope that the tutorial questions cover everything. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you can't say to me that well, you 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 forgot to put an intermediate value theorem problem on the tutorial, so therefore. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, if there are, if there are no more questions, then I will see you on Thursday.